Good morning. I'm Inez Barron, the Chair of the Committee on Higher Education, and I would like to welcome you all to our hearing on the Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Budget, the Fiscal 2019 Preliminary Mayor's Management Report, the 10-Year Capital Strategy, and the Fiscal 2019-2022 Preliminary Capital Commitment Plan for the City University of New York. We are joined by Matthew Sapienza, CUNY's Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer, and Judy Bertram, Vice Chancellor for Facilities Planning and Management. Thank you for joining us today. Before I begin, as we all know, this is Women's History Month, so I just want to share a brief bio with one of my heroes. Mary McLeod Bethune was an educator, a stateswoman, a philanthropist, and a civil rights leader, among other things. She was the 15th of 17 children whose parents had been enslaved. She walked five miles each day to go to school. Her teacher saw a greatness in her and helped her get a scholarship to Nova Scotia Seminary and then to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. She had hopes of becoming a missionary. But she did become a teacher in South Carolina and then moved to Atlanta, Georgia. In 1904, she started a small school with five girls and her own son. They were ages 16 to 12. She had $1.50, but had a desire and a commitment to make this school work. She rented a small house for $11.50, a month, and she raised money for her school by selling sweet potato pies, ice cream, and fried chicken, and no, fried fish. And she developed a curriculum that had the students understand self-sufficiency. She was able to garner daughter, dollars from wealthy donors, and her curriculum expanded and included home economics and crafts, and then to science, math, and business courses, and English and foreign language. Her small school that she started with $1.50 became what is now Bethune-Cookman College in Florida. And in addition to starting a school, she also started the first hospital for blacks in Daytona, Florida. So I just wanted to share that little bit of history with you uh, about who she was and her great contributions. We know that within the next few years, about 65% of all jobs will require post-secondary education. That is why I am, again, calling for a restructuring of the New York State education policy to provide an option to all students to continue in a free state-sponsored educational program for at least two years beyond secondary school. Historically, by the end of the 1800s, it was apparent that the compulsory education through grade eight was inadequate for the growing industrial age. And I think that we similarly here at this time have reached the point in the information age and advanced technology that requires high levels of education. And if we make provisions for post-secondary opportunities, we'll be able to extend, expand the career opportunities and increase access for those who have been marginalized and locked out. CUNY's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget of $1.18 billion does not vary much from its fiscal 2019 adopted budget. And that's a little disappointing because that means that there's not money built in to hire more full-time faculty. As always, there are items in the state's 2019-2020 executive budget that remain in question, such as the state's share of support for early childhood services and the ASAP programming. The fiscal 2020 preliminary budget also does not include council initiative support, such as funding for the city council merit scholarships or the university's development of new remediation programs. We will, of course, want to discuss all of those things here today. But this year, the council is taking a new approach to its preliminary budget hearings to more effectively ensure that the city's budget is fair, transparent, and accountable to all New Yorkers. While efficiency and performance have always been priorities in this body, today we plan to scrutinize the organization of the city's budget more closely than in past years. 
For CUNY, this means we will have a conversation again about the limited number of units of appropriation used to describe vast areas of the university's spending, particularly around the community colleges. We will also take a closer look at how CUNY organizes $594 million, 10, $500 million 10-year capital strategy and its $611.4 million capital commitment plan. Many city agencies, CUNY among them, develop plans that front load the vast majority of their funding into a single fiscal year, then commit only a fraction of that amount. Today, I would like to continue talking about why commitment rates are still low at CUNY and how we can work together to come up with a more rational capital spending plan. I also look forward to hearing more about how the university prioritizes its capital projects. This hearing presents us with an opportunity to review other programs and activities at CUNY as well. The state's requirement that all CUNY and SUNY campuses house food pantries raise important questions about costs and funding sources. And I would like to see where we are a year later and how CUNY students who are struggling to meet basic needs are doing. Turning to academics, CUNY has developed a number of programs and services to better meet the needs of the 21st century learners over the past few years, and I would like for us to discuss them as well. But we know that since the 1900s, CUNY has had a downward spiral in the number of black faculty, and over the last 20 years, up until 2018, CUNY has had an abysmal flat stagnant rate of 12% black faculty. As always, I look forward to discussing hiring practices and the need for increased diversity, both at CUNY's campuses and within its central administration. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank my staff, particularly Joy Simmons, my chief of staff, Indigo Washington, my CUNY liaison and director of legislation, Paul Senegal, my counsel to the committee, Michelle Perrigan, the finance analyst to the committee, Isha Wright, the unit head, and Chloe Rivera, policy analyst to the committee. At this time, I'm going to ask the council to administer the oath. Would you raise your right hands, please? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Please state your names for the record. Pull the mic closer. Matthew Sapienza. Judy Burke. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and staff of the City Council. I'm Matthew Sapienza, CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer. And I'm joined by Judy Berg, term CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor for Facilities Planning, Construction, and Management. We are also joined by several of our colleagues from the university who will assist in responding to questions and concerns from the committee. We appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about the Mayor's Fiscal Year 2020 Preliminary Budget and its effect on the City University of New York. Chairperson Barron, we very much appreciate your strong and continuing advocacy for our students. We come here today at a time of many positive developments at CUNY. Applications and new freshman enrollments continue to rise to record levels. More students come to CUNY college ready because of pioneering pre-matriculation programs like CUNY START. Fewer students are starting CUNY needing remedial courses, and those who do are moving to credit-bearing courses more quickly. As a result of our campus academic momentum campaigns, students across the university are making faster progress to graduation. For the first time with the fall 2016 cohort, more than 50% of bachelor students earned 30 credits in their first year, putting them on track to finish in four years. A record number of degrees, almost 54,000, were granted across CUNY in the 2017-2018 school year. Our six-year baccalaureate graduation rate has grown by nearly 25% over the last decade, and our three-year associate graduation rate has more than doubled. Undergraduate degrees awarded to black and Latino students have increased by over 70% during that same time period. We are very pleased with these results but are incredibly and rightfully proud that CUNY is arguably the most diverse university in the nation, if not the world. And we're also incredibly proud and pleased about the appointment of our new chancellor, Felix Matos Rodriguez. CUNY continues to be the best value in US higher education. 
CUNY costs a fraction of what students pay at private institutions, and it beats most public universities as well. A report issued last fall by the Rockefeller Institute of Government underscores this point. Rockefeller found that 79% of all undergraduates from CUNY's two-year and four-year schools graduated debt-free in 2017, a percentage that has remained stable since 2010. As a result of the generous financial aid programs, including the Tuition Assistance Program, Excelsior Scholarships, and the City Council of Alone Scholarships, along with the Federal Pell Grant Program and Federal Tuition Tax Credits, about two-thirds of CUNY students attend tuition-free. Only 11% of our full-time undergraduate students paid full tuition in the last academic year. All told, in the 2018 aid year, there, was, there were nearly 260,000 awards in federal and state education aid to CUNY students, totaling over $1 billion. All of this positive data accentuates the university's vital role as an engine of economic and social mobility in New York. Our fiscal year 2020 budget request is predicated on the idea that for the city and state of New York to thrive and lead in these times, CUNY must continue to play a key role in producing a highly educated workforce for the most globally competitive region of the nation. Now let me speak to the city's preliminary budget. We are pleased that the city's financial plan provides stability for our community college, colleges through the funding of mandatory costs related to fringe benefits, building rentals, and salary increases resulting from the university's recent collective bargaining agreement with District Council 37. Funding from prior plans will enable us to continue programs targeted at college readiness, such as Algebra for All, CUNY Math Start, and 12th grade proficiency. We are extremely grateful to the City Council and particularly the Higher Education Committee for securing resources in this year's budget for the Valone Merit Scholarships. We will ask for your advocacy again, as funding for this critical student support program was not included in the fiscal 20 preliminary budget, as you mentioned, Chair Barron. This initiative provides financial aid to students who graduated with an 80 average from New York City high schools and who maintain a B average at the university. These merit-based awards are available to deserving students at both the senior and community colleges and are a significant contribution to our efforts to speed time to degree. They demonstrate to our students in a tangible way that their city makes it possible to pursue an excellent post-secondary education right here at home. We look forward to working with you and ensuring that these financial aid awards are protected. We also need your help in restoring $2 million that was provided for remediation in the current fiscal year. CUNY has developed a plan to better tailor remedial instruction to the needs of its students and to accelerate their degree progress. Advisors strongly encourage students who have their, the greatest need, those who place into arithmetic and those who need remedial instructions in all three skills areas, reading, writing, and mathematics, to enroll in CUNY START or Math START, CUNY's effective programs that are helping students achieve proficiency. All of these interventions are low or no cost for the student. Our plan is to eliminate traditional course-based remedial instruction altogether within five years. Additional needs to support CUNY's ongoing efforts to increase completion rates are highlighted in our fiscal year 2020 budget request, which we have here. We are seeking city investment in several significant endeavors. The first is related to support for associate degree programs at our comprehensive colleges. The amount provided for these programs has remained constant at $32.3 million since 1995. Simply applying the Higher Education Price Index over that time period would result in an additional $32.8 million in annual recurring support. Our first category of strategic investments will expand upon proven approaches that advance student academic success and degree completion. We propose to expand our signature Accelerated Study and Associates programs, the ASAP program, it, it's, and its new four-year counterpart, Accelerate, Complete, and Engage, which we call ACE, and support other academic momentum initiatives that together are accelerating progress to completion, raising graduation rates, and crucially, closing racial achievement gaps. Expanding and supporting the growth of a diverse body of full-time faculty is also essential to all academic success initiatives. Second, we need to make sure that students do not become sidetracked in their academic pursuits by issues like food and housing insecurity unmet mental and, and physical health needs and the demands of child care and other basic needs. We propose to increase availability of campus child care as many of our 16 centers have waiting lists 
and to address student food insecurity and homelessness, both unfortunate trends in our student body. More specifically, almost 80% of CUNY's fir first-time freshmen come from the New York City public schools, where they are eligible to receive breakfast and lunch at no cost. Upon entering CUNY, students must pay in full for their meals. While the university has made a commitment to maintain food pantries and to provide food vouchers at the colleges, there is much more to be done. With additional funding, we would develop a program to provide swipe cards to be used at university cafeterias throughout the year. Third, we propose to invest in CUNY Works, a set of integrated bold new steps to ensure our students are well positioned to thrive in today's changing world of work. We will scale up CUNY's new workforce center to engage employers across 10 high growth sectors and translate their needs into career exploration and development, hard and soft skills training and job placement for our students. Similarly, we plan to grow the availability of paid internships and expand experiential and service learning for our students. Let me turn very quickly to the state budget. CUNY's request to the state includes a community college base aid funding increase of $250 per student full-time equivalent. And this increase in state funding along with continued city support would adequately support community college operations and enable the university to freeze community college tuition rates for a fourth straight year. In addition, we are hopeful that the Senate and Assembly will restore funding for ASAP and child care centers. Chairperson Barron and members of the committee, please be assured that the university deeply appreciates your continued commitment to a high quality CUNY education, which is the vehicle that so many New Yorkers rely on for the path of upward mobility. I would now like to ask Judy Bergstrom, our Senior Vice Chancellor for Facilities Planning and Construction Management, to talk about CUNY's capital budget. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and committee members. It is a pleasure to be here today. It is a pleasure to be here today, and I'm happy to have this opportunity to discuss with you our capital budget. The City Council has been an outstanding partner to CUNY, especially to our community colleges, by providing support for critical maintenance work in major new buildings. In recent years, your support has been instrumental in helping CUNY to complete pool restorations at BMCC and Bronx Community Colleges, major expansion of libraries at Mega Rivers and LaGuardia, creation of a new dining facility at Queensborough Community College, renovation of the 500 Grand Concourse building fourth floor at Hostos Community College, and installation of the largest photovoltaic array in Manhattan on BMCC Chamber Street building. All these projects added or upgrade space and have enriched those campuses with modern, well-designed facilities that inspire students. In recent years, the Council has provided hundreds of millions of dollars to CUNY that fund hundreds of projects, in particular at the community college. Because of your generous support of critical maintenance funding, CUNY has been able to address some of the most challenging critical maintenance issues at these campuses. In particular, your allocation of lump sum funds that allow CUNY to add to projects that are in process has helped CUNY move several important critical maintenance projects along. Last year, the council provided $10 million, which CUNY has requested, this, the, requested the state match that would then give us $20 million. As you know from our previous discussions, achieving a state of good repair within the system is CUNY's priority. One of the largest ongoing critical maintenance projects is the replacement of the facade at LaGuardia Community College's Center 3. This enormous building is 100 years old and its facade must be replaced if the building is to be preserved. I am happy to report that we expect to complete construction of this $125 million project by the end of the year. I hope you will all take pride in the realization of, of what will be a community treasure. If you've driven by the building recently, you must have noticed the amazing transformation. Other critical maintenance projects that have benefited from, benefited from council funding are the ongoing campus utility project at Bronx Community. We are completing phase four and starting phase five in the total. The project cost is over $170 million, and there is still yet another phase. A complete replacement of the electrical system at Queensborough Community College so that the college no longer suffers from power outages. And the phase renovation of Hostos Community College 500 Grand Concourse building. And roof replacements across the universities, which are in need of repair at every single campus. 
We are pleased to report all this activity, but must emphasize that critical maintenance continues to be our major capital priority at our community campuses, and we are still in need of your support for that long-term effort. We have over 7 million square feet of community college facilities, three quarters of which is over 40 years old. The most serious needs remain to be the infrastructure systems that support facilities operations. We are ple also pleased to inform you that we are planning to expand our space in Inwood for the CUNY and the Heights program associated with the Borough of Manhattan Community College and Hostos. The expansion will allow us to continue to increase vital higher education services to the community, providing many career ladders to educational attainment and career. We estimate that the expansion will cost $6 million. We continue to seek additional city and state funding building expansions projects in every borough. For instance, we are very much in need for another important initiative, which is $50 million for a new permanent facility for Gutman Community College. The work at our facilities continue and is integral to realizing those important goals. CUNY is a community treasure. Thank you for your support and all you do for CUNY and New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And we'll get right to the heart of the matter. <laughs> so we know that of the proposed $1.18 billion uh, that CUNY has proposed, 95% of that uh, falls into one of three categories, broad categories, units of appropriation. So the council has brought this to CUNY's attention several times. However, how is the conversation with the Office of Management and Budget Office of Management and Budget about restructuring funding to the community colleges into more units of appropriation going. Mm -hmm. Rather than have all of that in one. Yeah. How is that going? Yeah, no, thank you, Chair Barron. Um, yeah, currently we have five units of appropriation. We have a, a personal service and an, and an other than personal service, OTPS units of appropriation that mainly for our community colleges, as you mentioned. And then there's a, a separate PS and OTPS U of A for the Hunter Campus Schools. And then the fifth one is for our uh, appropriation to the senior colleges. Um, and so we have had discussions about, with OMB, about um, creating more units of appropriation, especially for those first two that I mentioned for the community colleges to break that out some more. Um, we don't have a, a final result of that yet, but we'll continue to talk to OMB through this budget cycle and happy to um, take input or recommendations from the council, the high rate committee or council finance staff about how we could be more transparent in terms of how we budget. How do you then internally uh, record and manage those shifts since it's not uh, designated uh, in a particular, had there been more uni units of appropriations, we'd be able to see and track that. How do you do that internally? Well, um, well, currently in, in the city's accounting system, in, in, in the financial management system, there is a budget code for each community college. So we are able in the city system to track it um, by community college. Um, and then in our own internal system, with, which interfaces with the city system, again, we do have specific accounting structures for our community colleges and for various programs within the community colleges. Um, so we are able to track it that way. but. But I hear you um, about providing more transparency and we're certainly, um, you know, we'll continue the discussions with the Office of Management and Budget about doing that. And again, happy to hear um, from whatever input you or the council staff might have about how we can, um, how we can help you in terms of getting information on, on CUNY's finances. Of the 1.18 billion, the $320 million for community college units of appropriation or one third is not directly assigned to an individual college. So that's a third of the budget that's essentially managed through a single budget code. How can we get greater transparency and part of that you just answered with a clear oversight? So what can you recommend that would help us to do that? And how was this funding used over the course of a year? Right. So that $320 million that's um, in, in that one account that you mentioned um, and is not distributed, not distributed to the community colleges, about two-thirds of that comes from centrally managed accounts for fringe benefits and for energy costs. 
So for fringe benefits and energy, um, we don't allocate those to the community colleges. We pay the bills centrally, um, and they all come out of that one account. Um, so that, that accounts for, for the, the bulk of that. Um, but again, we certainly can provide reports in terms of the distribution of fringe benefits to the community colleges and energy costs as well. We do, we do track that and can provide it. Uh, how many new needs have, has CUNY presented for this year? Right, no, thank you for asking that question. So we have our university budget request, which I'm gonna hold up to show all of you, and hopefully you'll have received or will be receiving your copy soon. Um, we do have uh, several requests to, um, to the city for funding um, for new needs. Some are mandatory, some are, are programmatic. Um, on the programmatic new needs, we were very encouraged the other day to hear the mayor's announcement and, and the council speaker's announcement about the Fair Fairs program, that that's going to include CUNY students, and so we're, we're very pleased about that. Um, that was part of our budget request. We did, we did ask for discounted Metro cards for our students. Um, we have a whole slew of needs um, in this document um, for food insecurity, homelessness, child care centers, um, additional faculty. Um, so it's all laid out in our budget request and um, they've been provided to the administration and we're hoping that in the executive budget that we'll see um, a good majority of our programs funded in the mayor's executive budget. You talked about hiring faculty. Yeah. What, what is your, uh, can you expand so, on that? Yeah, um, we are in this uh, budget request, which is the 2020 budget request, but we also include a four-year financial plan in the request. We are seeking to hire 200 additional full-time faculty across the university in each of those four years so that the increase would be 800 over, over four years. Right now we have about 7,500 full-time faculty, so this would um, grow to well over 8,000 over four years. So the number now is 7,500? It's about 7,500. Yeah, we can get you the, approx the exact number, I should say, but it's around 7,500 full-time faculty. Thank you, Michael. It's actually 7,627 for fiscal 18. Okay. And what would be the cost for 200 additional full-time instructors mm -hmm. for each of those four years? The well, over the four years uh, that you're talking about. Right, the cost for the additional, um, we're, uh, for fiscal 20, um, it's 8.3 million at the senior colleges and 4.1 million at the community colleges. So it's about $12.5 million a year. So over the four years, um, it would be about $50 million over the four years. So I was gonna talk about this a little later on, but since we're here, mm -hmm. how are we going to make sure that uh, CUNY has a term underutilization and labor market indicators. How is CUNY going to make sure that we meet the goals that we've set? In your 2012 to 2016 so called master plan, you said that you would have a council of inclusion and excellence, and their recommendations would ensure diversity in departments and executive. Uh, centers. You would have a faculty fellowship, publication program, diversity project, development fund, postdoctoral program, CUNY scholar diversity. That was in your 2012-16 plan. Mm -hmm. So now you're talking about hiring more faculty, but the hiring that you have done has not changed the percentage of faculty, particularly black faculty, mm -hmm. has not changed that number overall. So what are we going to do different so that at the end of next year, when you come here again, we're not still at 12%? Yeah, and I, I want to point out to you, Chair Brown, a few things. But one yes. is, in our budget request, the, the category that we have full-time faculty, we call expand and support diverse body of full-time faculty because we know that not only hiring new faculty is important but making sure that we yes. have a diverse body of full-time faculty is important. We know that there's an issue that you've raised um, over the years and, and we appreciate the, the need to do that. 
Um, so a few things I would say. One is that I know um, the higher ed committee had a hearing back in the fall yes. on this topic where our, our interim Chancellor Vita Rabinowitz testified along with President Jose Luis Cruz at Lehman College and Claudia Schrader from Kingsborough yes. Community College. Um, so since then, a um, couple things I just want to report on. One is um, the Chancellor's Faculty Diversity Working Group, which was chaired by President Cruz at Lehman College and President Michelle Anderson at Brooklyn College, finalized their report on the Faculty Diversity Working Group and presented it to our Board of Trustees at their November meeting. So now the, the recommendations for that report are being rolled out to our campuses. Um, one of the things that we're really excited about um, that is being worked on also by our Office of Human Resources is that they're, they're developing a diversity dashboard. So they're developing technology where um, we can more easily and transparently report and our colleges can more easily track um, the diversity numbers at their campuses. So that's under development now, but we're really encouraged that's going to help um, significantly. So. Um, we will continue to report on the progress here. Um, most of the hiring that happens in faculty hire happens in the fall semester when we're starting a new academic year. So the recommendations that report, we won't see bear fruit right now, but we think for next fall when we hire a new uh, cadre of faculty that we will see some progress and we'll be happy to come back and report to you on that. In your, at the, um I'm not sure. In the June, I think, 2018 Board of Trustees meeting, Queens College had an entry on the calendar where they wanted to, they, where they awarded a contract of s not to exceed $6 million to develop the International Student Success Program for the purposes of bringing in international students. And they projected that it would generate $12 million annually in tuition. So of course they had some uh, economic motive to having this program. Sure. How much money is CUNY devoting in dollar amounts to making sure that we get the diversity, the black in increase that we say we want to have? How much money, what's the dollar amount yeah, I, that CUNY is putting to that? Because we know talk is cheap, as they say, but when we want to really do something, we put some dollars to it to back it up. So what's the dollar amount? Yeah. If CUNY thinks this is important and recognizes the advantages of having a diverse faculty, both as models for students and increased intelligence and interaction and uh, being able to move about in a very diverse world, what's the dollar amount that CUNY is dedicating to make this a reality so that it comes off the pages of the uh, master plan and the connected CUNY plan? Yeah, um, we will get you that number, Chair Baron. I don't have it today. Um, there are things that we're doing centrally, like you, you mentioned earlier, the faculty fellowship uh, program, which we are, we're um, administering centrally. There are things that our colleges are doing on their individual campuses. So. We will go back and work with our campuses um, to find out what each of them are spending on diversity initiatives and um, combine that with what we're doing centrally and, and be able to report back to you. But one thing, because you raised the chair, I just want to mention very quickly about international yes. students. And we're very um, pleased with the, with the program that Queens College is putting in place. But um, we all have to be mindful with international students with that net throughout the country the number of international students that are coming to the United States is, has been going down the last couple of years yes. with some of the concerns coming from the changes at the federal government. So that's something that we're concerned about as well um, and that we're keeping our eye on. But um, innovative things like Queens College are doing, I think, will, will help a lot. Okay, back to the other broader questions. Uh, well, of course, you know, that's the interest that I have and have always had. Absolutely. Looking to make some concrete changes and improvements. Um, in the mayor's briefing, the administration called for programs to eliminate the gap um, of 750 million to be reflected in the executive budget. And as part of that plan, CUNY uh, was asked to peg uh, 6.8 million. So how do you plan to achieve this peg? Mm -hmm. I, of course, don't think that we should be reducing the programs, but this is what the mayor has proposed, and this is what we're negotiating about. But how are you planning to address uh, that peg? 
Yeah, no, thank you for raising that, Chair Brown. We were notified on, um, on Tuesday of this week of our target, which was, as I mentioned, $6.8 million. Right. Um, Certainly, um, you know, we, we want to see funding increases in our operating and, and capital budgets. And so anytime there is there is a PIG program, that, that creates a challenge for our campuses. Um, we will need to work with our campuses um, individually to um, distribute that reduction target to them and have them come back to us and let, let us know how they're going to do it. I'm sure they'll, they'll have to be um, some service reductions, but I know um, our community colleges will do what they can to try to keep that away from direct um, instruction and student support costs to our students. So, so we don't have a plan fully fleshed out yet. I will add that in our budget request, we were targeting about $6.6 .6 million in administrative efficiencies at our community colleges for next year. So the number is very close to what we were planning to do anyway, which is good. Um, but we'll try to do as much from the administrative areas and, again, keep it away from instructional and student support areas as we can. So you just said you had targeted $6.6 .6 million at the uh, campuses and the administrative? At the community colleges, yes. Now, in our budget request, we had targeted $6.6 .6 million administrative efficiencies, and we wanted to redirect those to our strategic investments um, in academics and in student support. Um, that was our plan, um, but now it appears that, that those funds are gonna have to go towards the PEG program, unfortunately, but, um, but we do have plans in place to try to um, create, uh, uh, achieve those savings through administration and not through instruction or student support. So is that going to be a one shot or is that going to be baselined? We're planning that it's baseline. We're planning that it is going to be baselined. And will, how will each campus uh, be given a target amount? Will it be based on the student population, or what's the criteria? Each school is given a targeted amount, and it's different for each yeah. school. Yes, and so how is that calculated? Yeah, we, we haven't distributed it yet, but usually it's it's based on the operating budget for each of those campuses. So $6.8 million, we have seven community colleges. Um, some are larger than others, so, um, you know, the, but proportionally it'll be based on, on, um, on their operating budget. That's what we've done historically. So it will, will it be an equal percentage of each school's operating budget? Yes, yes. Okay. A few more questions before I go to my colleagues. Sure. The fiscal 2019 budget included one-time various intra-city transfers of 12.1 of million added to student internship and fellowships. 121 million added, thank you, to student internships and fellowships, and the largest of which includes 45 million for mental health support work. We know that's a very critical issue. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about this program, how many students participate, and what are the service uh, that's taking place? Yes, no, thank you. We do have a very uh, robust intra-city program. We do, as, you, as you mentioned, Chair Barron generated about over $100 million a year um, in intra-city revenue. But the program you mentioned is a collaboration between Hunter College, which I know you're, you're a very proud alum of Hunter, um, Hunter College and the City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, and it's a four-year grant, and the purpose of the program is to develop what, what we're calling the Mental Health Service Corps um, that will recruit, train, and integrate more than 300 um, early career behavioral health clinicians um, in healthcare practices um, that would be um, distributed throughout all of the neighborhoods of New York City. Um, and so these clinicians would serve in the Mental Health Service Corps for three years and they would earn valuable experience in, in their clinical work. Um, and so, again, we're very excited about this. There's 300 students that are, that are participating, and, and the grant is for four years. Are these students located throughout the campuses, or are they concentrated, or is it just at it's, Hunter? It's, right, it's, it's a collaboration. Uh, it's at Hunter College, but um, these students are uh, distributed throughout uh, the five boroughs, so they're, they're working throughout New York City. Okay, and CUNY has a historical relationship with other city agencies in providing services in partnership to their students. What new programs are, what new programs are on the horizon that we can look forward to? 
Yeah, no, we have a lot of terrific agreements with uh, our partners and other city agencies. Um, one of the ones that we're really excited about, we call the CUNY Internship Program, um, and it's for IT jobs for our students. And so um, through this program, we're offering over 700 internship programs um, throughout 18 different city agencies. Um, and we expanded it this year. Um, and the, one of the things I always try to point out and, uh, and historical, a uh, historical program that we've had that's an interested agreement with Do It is um, the 311 Center. Uh, very often I say if people call the 311 Center, there's a very good chance that a CUNY student is going to answer the phone. So CUNY students are very involved in that as well. But, um, but the internship program is what we're really excited about to be able to provide work experience for our students um, and provide services to our fellow city agencies. And as we're talking about that, uh, are there any plans for using this opportunity of gathering information from the census to make a partnership with that so that CUNY students can be engaged in that? Yeah, that's a good thought. And, and we've had some preliminary discussions about the census and, and what opportunity that can have for our students. And so um, I appreciate that, that suggestion and, and we'll bring it back to folks at central office and, and see what, uh, what role CUNY students can play in that process. I think the uh, deadline is quickly approaching, so you might want to really have somebody look at that very quickly. And can you just quickly give us an update on the, what was it, the, um, the solar program that CUNY had been involved with? It's New York Solar Smart. Yeah. Um, we have, in, as I reported before, we have the, um, the largest solar, solar array on uh, the Can campus. Can you pull the mic a little closer? Thank you. As I reported before, we just um, completed the installation of the largest solar array in Manhattan on Bronx Community College. We're doing another program on the um, facilities at Queens College. Um, we have an ombudsman to the industry that basically assists companies in registering to be, to provide solar. So we have a whole unit that, that takes care of that. And, and I, think, I think we made history in, in Manhattan and I think we're gonna made, make history in Queens at Queens College. Okay, I'm gonna take a step off break and I'm gonna defer to one of my colleagues, Council Member. We've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez and Council Member Holden, and Council Member Rodriguez has some questions. And then I'll come back. Thank you, Chair. I believe that CUNY, of course, most of us, we are proud of CUNY. We would not be here without having that big door that opened to us in different occasions, be able to get a degree. For me, the best master degree that I got was non bilingual education, but yet to be an activist. And, and I think that that's an experience that is priceless. I believe that CUNY is in crisis right now. And I believe it's a matter of time when that will blow up. I believe that it's happening under our watch. And I don't know how much more we will continue to suppress that reality to put those numbers out because here we come every year and we share those numbers but at the same time that we as a city and the state talk about providing three billion dollars subsidy to Amazon for me I'm talking about as a former grad and someone who cared for CUNY and someone as a former teacher that know that the dozen or hundreds of students that I taught for 13 years, they only were able to become top engineer from City College because CUNY opened the door to them. But when I saw that all the conversation, and of course everyone had to play their role, I don't want to put you on the spot. It is our role to watch this. I don't think that CUNY was and it is seriously considering to be a top partner to talk about with they said $3 billion incentive to Amazon, they should be $500 million incentive to CUNY. Are the institution that should be the one training those workforces? That is not enough to say we will create 25,000 jobs, 25,000 jobs of people that will rotate 
from Google to Apple to Facebook, from California to New York City. But not a plan to say, CUNY will play a role training those at least 50% New Yorkers from here who we should aim to be working with Amazon if by any chance Amazon will be coming here. So when I look at these numbers and our realities about, are we living in night? Are we living in a dream? Like, are we really putting, it, we are living like the MTA, a crisis that for decades we tried to handle with a, with a vantage. And no one's talking about it until the last three years. They will say, what the hell is going on? How many colleges at CUNY are operating on deficit? Um, and, and if you don't mind, just throw me the number. How many campus do we have? We have 25. 25. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm doing my part. I don't want to put the leadership on the spot. And my role to advocate from Auburn into the city. How many of the 25 are right now operating on deficit? In our media finance report, which we issued a few months ago, there were, there were three colleges of the 25. Oh, I'm sorry. In our mid-year finance report that we issued a few months ago, we were projecting that three colleges would end the current fiscal year in deficit. Yeah, and that's, <clears throat> it's the, and that's our reality. And again, of course, like, it's like I used to be a former a co-founder of Luperon High School, small school, mm -hmm. coming, created for two new coming students from Latin America, from Jay Hutchinson to John, to all of you, created a good pipeline to connect the student with opportunity. We even went through the process when the students, they were not accepting the senior colleges. City College did a pipeline, a pilot program, and they took a number of students that in the traditional way, they would be reject, rejected from the senior colleges. And they did it, again, the pilot program, and they proved that all the students that they took, they not only graduated, but they graduated with a three point above average. And now they are professional, now they are middle class, and now they're contributing more. So when I look as, again, Luperon is my, my baby. Mm -hmm. Even though I had to advocate for George Washington and other school, because that is good that I went after graduating in 93 from City College. So when I look at City College now, and I see that to graduate a student in the school, in the school of engineering costs three times or more compared to the average students, and the college is not getting those money. So here, from, and this is the college that in the nation graduated the largest numbers of, stu of a person, a student of color. So when and how can we, from the city to the state, address that reality to say, and, and, and we know that's one of the colleges that is operating on deficits. So what is our plan? How can we be hopeful? And what will you do from you and from central office to address colleges such as City College that they have department in schools that it costs them three or four or five times more? I did political science by a school of engineering costs like 15,000 and probably 3,000 for a political science or, or another area. Well, how, will, how are you, central office, being helpful? Because we're talking about a college that is operating in a deficit of more than $10 million, that they have a school of HOF, that they have a school of engineering, that it costs them much more. And those school chairman is the one that we have the better opportunity to see more, especially black and Latino students, in graduating from engineering to the school of health. So how is CUNY dealing with this program and how this budget will reflect a change to be helpful to colleges such as City College? Mm -hmm. I think hearings like this are, are very helpful to that process um, for us to communicate um, very directly to whether it's the city council or when we testify in Albany to the state legislature about what our, what our serious and critical needs are. We have our budget requests for fiscal 2020 and our four-year plan. 
um, where we're la laying out the needs um, on the operating and, and on the capital side as well. Um, I think that this budget request that we put together this year, um, which our Board of Trustees um, approved back in January, that this was probably the, the boldest and most aggressive request that we've had in, in many, many years at the university, because as to your point, uh, Councilman Rodriguez, we wanted to make sure that folks in both city government and state government understood what the needs of our campuses are, what the needs of our students are. So this is a very um, aggressive request. Um, we worked very hard on it and, and had um, good direction from not only um, the administration but from our board of trustees. We're very involved in putting the, the request together this year, which we appreciate. Um, and from our perspective, we, we are asking the city to contribute more, asking the state to contribute more, but to your point, we know that we have to do more internally at, as administrative leadership as well. And so we do have an administrative efficiency program that we're in year two of where we're targeting $75 million in administrative efficiencies so that that can go back into investments in both instruction and student support. And the other thing that we're, we're targeting is we know we need to do more fundraising, um, both from the central office and, and our campus leadership as well. So we are doing that. For the campuses that are um, projecting deficits and that are feeling some fiscal stress, we, we worked with them just about every single day to try to identify not only resources for them, but also efficiencies and how they can um, be better at, at using their funds. And I know um, folks at the campuses are working very hard to try to do that. So. It is a collaborative effort, um, but we're certainly looking for um, opportunities like this, like this morning, to, to make our, our case to here at the City Council, but also to our funding partners um, in the administration and at state government as well. My, my last part is that, first of all, I, I believe that it is our responsibility, even though we expect it from Provost to President to raise money, but I feel that it is our responsibility to also to have a plan to say in this budget, we're gonna be working together so that those colleges get the support that they need to cover the deficit that they have. Because even though we have seen a reduction of population, especially students of color, in the, senior, in the top senior colleges, when I was there, 80% of the students, they were black and Latino. Today, student population, black and Latino, even though we grow up, and today population in the city is 29% Latino, 27% of American, our numbers are on 70%. So we've been going down in senior colleges. So by still, those are the colleges that we are seeing some diversity. So it is tough. Those colleges, when the positions are empty, they're frozen those positions. They are not hiring new people. And those are positions that they are important to provide the services to our students. It's not only that we have 7,000 something. What happened when one of those positions already, that person retired seven months ago? Those president cannot hire those re replacement. That's the direction that they have from central offices. So it's not that the new one will add 7,000 more. Is that in city, in CUNY today, president had a hand tight right now because of the financial situation. And here, yeah, we do a lobbyist day, the student go there and advocate. And here we can, you're doing the best you can. But we are not providing the financial support that CUNY need in order for those institutions to deal with the deficit. And they are the only opportunity that someone like me, a person who comes from the working class, underserved community, they will have to be graduating. We know that ASAP work, but still the funding is not there to cover every single student. We know that college prep work, but we know that we are not providing, be able to get the financial support to enroll every single student to be part of the college. Now, so it's like the movies is over. It's like, you know, I, are we like going around telling the same movies that we did like before I became, the, I was the chairman of this committee and, and council member Barrow and now in the, in the, in the, our chair and Barrow too. It's like, you need help. 
And I know that you're limited to be open on all the crisis that CUNY is going through. We need to do our part. Because this crisis, we know we're holding too much to learn. This crisis will explode in our head. So I feel that the top colleges, the community college, they need financial support, and it should be included as any subsidy that we bring from the Auburn to the New York City to any private corporation. This is the best investment that we can make. And the budget that we are allocating is not enough, from the city to the state. So all I'm saying is about to my colleagues, from you guys, you know, I know that you're limited on how much you share with us. We need more information. We need to deal with this crisis because our, if no, our children will pay the consequences. The last question for me is about, and of course, on the hiring. You're sounding like the Baptist preacher who says, and as I close, and as I close. So please make this your last question because we have to get back to the other questions. On Thank hiring, you. we have a crisis. We are not ready to handle it. The hiring committee a structure that we have through colleges doesn't reflect diversity. You go one by one. The composition of the hiring committee the process of the hiring committee is not structured to bring the diversity that we deserve in the city of New York. It's controlled by white male. And you can go and look at it one by one. I hope that someone will take the initiative to handle with this. The institute, and that's in 30 seconds, my finish with this, how the funding that we are putting to the institute, that money, will that money go directly to them from day one? Because that's not happening. The funding that we allocated to the Dominican, to the Puerto Rican, to the Mexican Institute, as soon as the handshake is done and the money is approved, that money should be sent in directly and that money should not be used as a reduction or the investment that CUNY is doing. So what is going on? How can we assure that all the funding for this fiscal year, in the next few days, they will be sending completely to other institutes? And what plan do we have, sir? When we put the funding for the next coming budget, that money will be going to them directly. Yeah, no, I'm glad you raised that, uh, Chairman, uh, former Chairman Rodriguez, but Councilman Rodriguez, about the institutes, because that is a key component that, again, we're going to be looking to the Council to help us on, to restore funding for those institutes. Um, Centro, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College, uh, the Dominican Studies Institute, as you mentioned, the Mexican Institute. None of that funding was put in the Mayor's preliminary budget. Um, they were all zeroed out, so we are looking, going to be looking to the Council to help us get those funds restored. And to your question, 100% of what the council allocates to those institutes goes directly to those institutes, 100%. When um, When the fiscal year opens, we, we work with our campuses to try to turn the, those funds around as quickly as we can. Um, but 100% goes to those institutes. Thank you, council member. Um, in your testimony, you indicated that the roof replacements across the university uh, is a major project, and all of the campuses are in need of repair. What's the cost of these roof replacements? The, 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 the roof replacements can... Can you turn your mic on? It, can, it, it depends upon the size of the roof. The roof can, replacements can go from five... Okay, so what have you budgeted for these roof replacements? The total amount, 30, $35 million. And are all college campuses going to be having, will have their roofs replaced? Or are you, have you targeted particular? Well, uh, we have 300 buildings, but on every single campus, we are looking at replacing roofs. So if uh, I- so, some, some, you know, if you take a, some campuses we're replacing um, a, a large roof. Some campuses we're replacing a small roof. It depends, but where we are hitting every single campus, and that's a priority. So you will see for the next, let's say, f 
four or five years that we will continue to do that. So That's, it's ongoing. It's ongoing, right. Because okay. here's the problem. If you don't fix the roof, you basically doing any work inside the building could be affected by that. So that is, I don't want to say the number one priority, but that's up there. So any, if you go to any campus, you will find us repairing some roof. So in your 10-year capital strategy, uh, the city's 10-year strategy totals $104 billion, and that's $14.5 billion larger than the $89.6 billion fiscal year 2018-2028 10 strategy plan. 10-year plan. And CUNY's 10-year capital strategy totals $594 million, which is just 2% of the city's total strategy. So is this actually a 10-year plan when you front load in, let's say, data processing, you have uh, an amount for 2020, you have uh, an amount for 2021, and 2022, and then it sort of zeroes out and the same thing with energy conservation projects. Uh, in 2021, in 2022, you have amounts and then it's zeroed out. So are we to think that those are the only years that the money is needed or the project will be completed in just those years that's indicated here? Well, so, if, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So if, if you just look at data processing and you look at 23 million and you yes. take the 23 million and you divide by our, let's say, 24, 25 campuses, that's not a significant amount of money for each campus. So that's where you get the 23. And for CUNY, because we're doing renovations all over every campus, you could have included in those renovations funding for um, IT infrastructure and IT equipment. So this doesn't really capture um, the whole plan. But why are there any dollar amounts for 2024, 20, 25, 26, 27? We're going uh, this, to, this is kind of the amount of money that we have. We will come back and talk to you. Um, we will come back and talk to you about what's needed. Now, as far as the planning goes, because I know you're, um, you've brought this up before, how, how do we plan? How do we know what we, what we need going forward? So this document is our planning document. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Not, not so much um, the capital commitment plan that you see here. So this document is like 250 pages, and it lists for every single campus what the priorities are. We the, usually get that in January when we go to the uh, Right, right. Okay. Um, you can so, get it online. So do you for, work with OMB on long-term planning, and is, is it reflected in the strategy? Any, any involvement that you have with OMB for this planning? Uh, and what's the portion of CUNY's property, what portion of CUNY's property is city owned versus leased? And I think about a year ago I asked you, what was the valuation of the real estate that's, that CUNY owns? I don't know if I ever got an answer to that question. So what portion is city owned versus leased? What is the value of the property that city, uh, the real estate that CUNY owns, and what portion of CUNY's community college property is city owned versus leased, particularly for the community colleges? Uh, um, for all of CUNY, we have somewhere between 28 and 29 million square feet. Of that, a million of that is leased, is leased space. One million of? Of the 28 million. 28 million, okay. And is, the value, I, I I think it's 30, the value of replacing all of CUNY is 33. I think it's 30. I, I, I'll get back to you, but I think the value of repla re replacing every building at CUNY is like $33 billion. But let me get back to you. That's what I remember. And, and for community colleges, what, uh, what portion is city owned? Do you have that breakout? I don't, but I can give that to you. Okay, so we could ask you for that as well. Um, so. Uh, CUNY has, CUNY relies on 100 billion, 100 buildings to support students across its seven community college. And we know that these buildings are more than 50 years old, and many of these buildings are close to 100 years old. So how do we prioritize the capital plan? And we've asked this question before. Okay. Of all of those entries in your book, how do we prioritize those? Okay. 
there's, there's two ways we prioritize. One is we sit down and actually we're starting the process again, again as of April 1st. We sit down uh, with every, sing every single campus and we look at what projects are ongoing. Then we look at what we asked for the year before and we basically come up with what the priority is for the, the, the campus and what we believe the priority. And where does this come from? In 2000, the first time we did it was 2007, then 2012 we did an update and now we are doing an, un, an update to look at the condition of CUNY and look at every single system and come up with a priority of what needs to be replaced. So we do it with this is with the campuses, and then we have a numerical system where we basically take a look at it to bring the, to bring CUNY up to the state of good repair. So we do it two different ways. And just before I go to Council Member Holden, uh, CUNY School of Medicine at City College liaison, has a liaison committee on medical education is the official accrediting body for medical education programs in the US and Canada that lead to an MD degree. And their visit was on January 21st. How can you tell, can you tell the committee the results of their visit and can you give us an update on the process that the CUNY School of Medicine's accreditation process is in? Is it ongoing? What's the time frame? And is the LCME inquiring into the financials of the school? Mm -hmm. I can take that one, Chair Barron. Um, the LCME, I, I don't have a, a, a formal response about the specific visit that they had in, in January, but um, they have been visiting. There is a partial accreditation of the medical school by the LCME, and we are um, working with both the, the medical school and the LCME to ensure that full accreditation is granted um, to the college, which we're hoping will be later this year. Um, we are- Later this year, <clears throat> they should receive full accreditation. 2019, that's what, that's, what we're, that's what we're expecting and we're hopeful, but we know that we have to provide um, some more information to LCME, which we're happy to do. Um, I know that there are uh, meetings coming up, which I will be participating in and our interim chance will be participating in as well. Um, to your point, we want to ensure that the LCME that um, the financial supports are in place for the medical school. Um, it, it was a big um, priority in our budget request as well. Uh, we are seeking additional funds from the state for the medical school, but um, they're doing good work at the medical school and uh, we wanna be supportive of them and we'll work with the college and the LCME to ensure full accreditation shortly. And who's leading the uh, School of Medicine? Is there a person in the position of the yeah, dean? Yeah, the, the uh, founding dean for the medical school um, was a gentleman named Maurizio Trevisan, and he recently resigned, I believe it was back um, in January. Um, and there is a, um, an interim dean that has been appointed right now, um, who was um, Dean Trevisan's deputy, so it's um, you know, been a seamless transition so far. And it is part of the of, of City College, and so President Vince Boudreau um, has ultimate authority of the medical school since it is part of City College. So, are you confident that uh, the accreditation requirements will be met in full? Yes, I know we still have a lot of work to do on that, and and again, I know the LCME um, has very um, you know strict and and important guidelines that have to be met, but we are confident that um, they will be met. Thank you. Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Chair Barron. Um, I want to congratulate um, Vice Chancellor Bertram for a wonderful building at City Tech that was just um, opened or ribbon cutting. I attended the ribbon cutting. It's a magnificent, I only saw the auditorium, but it's a world class auditorium. And th they had to wait until I left after 40 years at City Tech <laughs> to, to build this wonderful building. But um, I, I just, you know, and by the way, t speaking of the roof, on, on Nam Hall, I was there 40 years. We're on the top floor, the 11th floor of Nam Hall. There wasn't a year that it, the roof didn't leak. It, <laughs> we had to constantly, it would actually, you know, get into the computer um, and, and destroy equipment. And, um, but we had leaks for every year for 40 years. And that's how 
how bad it is. And I, so I understand that it takes a tremendous capital um, allotment, a budget to, to address just some of the campuses, and it's, it's, but we always had a problem there. But it's a great building. I just want to um, ask Vice Chancellor Sapienza, um, I missed how many faculty lines that we're, we're going to, uh, to hire uh, oh, full yeah. time. No, thank you. Um, in our budget request, we are seeking to hire 200 additional full-time faculty in each of the next four years. So it would be a total of 800 over four years. And those will be new lines. So how many people on an average, how many full-timers retire in, in a particular year? Yeah, um, it's usually um, a few hundred, two to three hundred per year, depending on you know any one year. But but yes, that's a so two to three hundred a year. Th so these we're are not net. we're not keeping pace then. Yeah, yeah, no, th these are net positions. So so we want to replace the people that will that will attrit, whether through retirement or, or leaving the university. And on top of that, we want to have two hundred new. Do okay. Lines. So yes. these are yeah. So because that would happen in our department. We yeah. uh, I was in communication design. And we'd always, every, every year we lost. If somebody retired, we would hope to retain that line, yeah. but didn't. No, it's an important distinction. Budget these, cuts. These, these are 200 net new positions yeah. that we're seeking. Okay, that's a good target. I'm, I'm glad. What's the um, university-wide, what's the fa full-time faculty-student ratio? Uh, because we never reached close to the, our target uh, um, in full-time faculty ratio to, to student. Yeah. We, um, you know, I, I think a, um, a data point that we look at when it comes to that is the uh, amount of instruction that's taught by full-time faculty. And that number has been pretty stagnant over the last several years. It's in the high 40, 46, 47, 48 percent range. Um, and we certainly like that to be higher. One of the challenges is trying to secure funding to hire an additional full-time faculty. But one of the challenges that we also have had has been that our enrollment has continued to grow, so we haven't been able to, to keep pace. And so um, our overall number of 7,627, um, when you compare it to you know, 10 years ago, ha a number of full-time faculty has grown, but our enrollment has grown as, at a greater rate, and so we haven't been able to keep pace. So thank you, Michael. So the ratio of um, full student full-time equivalent, equivalent to full-time faculty um, for fall 2017 was at 28.8. You know, so the number of student full-time equivalents to full-time faculty is 28.8. Hey. So 28 to 1? Yes. Tw which is a lot. And, and the problem with uh, CUNY over the, um, I started in the 70s at, at City Tech. Um, what happened? <laughs> I thought it was, um, I started in the 70s and we had, um, let's say, uh, if we had 20 full-timers, we had 10 adjuncts, and it turned upside down, actually to the point where we had, in, in my department, over 100 uh, part-time adjuncts and less than 20 full-time. So, and the university was going in that direction, and, and as a result, the students didn't get the um, mentoring, we did, they didn't, because only the full-time at that point full-time faculty had office hours where the adjuncts didn't. Some of the adjuncts now have an, an one-hour office, but th that's not nearly enough. So, and many of the students, as, as years went on, would need more counseling. They would need more mentoring, more um, job placement, which a lot, a lot of the faculty in our department did. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what I, what, and I know it, it's a, it was a, always budgetary. We never got enough from the state um, or the city, but I just hope we can turn that around a bit because mm -hmm. it's, it hurts the students. We would see that, you know, you'd have lines out the door. Um, you'd have to go way beyond, as a full-timer, uh, go way beyond your, your office hours to just, you know, my department had 1,000 students, or it still has 1,000 students in one department. And if you had 20 faculty, full-time faculty, you were overwhelmed. So I, I'm glad that we're going to hire at least 200 per year, mm -hmm. in addition to the ones, uh, the faculty that, re that retires, but still we're so behind in that area. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple of, just, am I allowed a couple, one, one or two more questions, uh, Chair, Chair Barron? Yes. Okay. Um, the child care, I know, I know Queensboro community doesn't have child care. Are we, are we looking in the future to try to get that there? Um, 
Well, uh, we, have a, I, we have 16 child care centers currently, um, so we don't have it at every campus. Um, and, uh, but shouldn't I, that be the target going forward? Absolutely, and as part of our budget request as well, we were seeking uh, $1.8 million for additional child care um, services, additional slots for our students. Um, we want to try to make sure that the child care centers are open in the evenings because we have a lot of students that are coming in the evenings and any child care services. So um, that's a, a really important component of our budget request. Um, and again, we're looking um, to both the state and city to, to uh, help us on that because both the state's proposed budget and the city's preliminary budget would reduce the funding to child care centers currently. So we're looking to not only get those funds restored, but to, to have enhanced services as well through our budget request. Okay, and just um, uh, how many of those um, child care um, facilities take in infants? Because I know some of them don't. And I, I think City Tech at one time might have had infants, but then they yeah. don't do it anymore. I think that's. Yeah, Fuente is our. Because that's when you actually Fuente's need. That's when you need the child care the most. If you're, if you're, you know, if uh, if uh, you have a baby and then you want to go back to school, you have to wait sometimes years. So. Just before you answer, I'll ask the council to administer the oath. Yes, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Please state your name for the record. Keisha Fuentes. <coughs> yes. um, currently, we have four centers that have um, infant, infant child care programs. Um, we have several centers that would like to open up for infants. However, they do not have the space, and they will need capital funds in order to do so. Right now, we only have four. <coughs> So at least at, at Cid, so there's no uh, infant care at City Tech, and they just opened a new building. Right, there's none at City well, Tech. Well, we should. I, I, that's why I mentioned at, at a previous hearing that before the build, building was actually completed, that we should at City Tech um, expand, because that's again, that's what I, you know, I had students that had to leave and t and take leave because. Um, of the pregnancy, and we, I didn't see her for years after that because there was no way that she could uh, get the child care. So it's very important um, that we try to go in that direction, especially in the budget. I'd like to see that happen. Um, it happened a lot. And at City Tech, when you open a new building, you get more space, and there should be, you know, at least in that school, but certainly Queensboro has a lot of space, has many buildings, a sprawling campus, and no child care, no child care whatsoever. So I think we need to, and I know, you know, you, you want this to happen, so I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not blaming anyone. I just think we need to make it a priority. Um, as for diversity, that um, I was on the appointments committee in my um, college for over 20 years. Uh, P and B in some colleges that we, we, we would actually do the interview interviewing and hire faculty, and I never thought that um, the colleges or at least my college put enough emphasis on hiring from the adjunct pool. And in, and again, in my department, we had over a hundred uh, adjuncts to choose from, and so we knew we we actually knew their qualifications. We knew um, by a resume, you can't tell the person's race more often than not. So we would pick the best three resumes or best 10 resumes. We'd uh, call in uh, to, for the interviews and then um, submit three to the administration best, based on their interviews. But we knew that we had a, um, many times 100 a uh, adjuncts to choose from, and it seems that the university or the, um, the college or the administration was not interested in hiring from within. So I think and, and to address the diversity problem throughout the university, um, again, I mentioned this at one hearing, look at the adjunct pool um, to, to actually reach your goals, because you have very, very good adjuncts. Uh, many times, most, many of them were in the industry and certainly had the experience. And, 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 you, and many times we had adjunct faculty teaching for decades mm -hmm. and excellent, excellent faculty. So I would, I would urge that, that you try that. Thank oh, you. Thank you, Councilman Holden. That's a great point. And um, over the last 10 years or so, um, I think there have been three instances where we worked with our faculty and the professional staff Congress to do adjunct to lecturer conversions to move, uh, as you say, long serving adjuncts who qualify for the lecturer position 
into the full-time lecturer position. And I think we've done, um, the total was about, I think it was about 200, but we can get you the exact number of adjuncts that converted to lecturers. And I know our campuses were very happy with that, so we're, we're hoping that we can do um, some more conversions in the future. And Councilman Holden, Nam Hall has a new roof. New roof. Again, it figures when I leave, everything improves, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Just before, uh, I just want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Kalos and Councilmember Lori Cumbie, Cumbo, I'm sorry. Just before I go to you, Councilmember, it's a quick question. I'm going to defer and let my colleague go because he went and came back. Thank you. Uh, we're, there's a lot happening. We're mayors having a press conference on mayoral control. We're also having a press conference because uh, they want to steal uh, the, the revenues from marijuana legalization from low-income communities. Who said that it's going to go through? So you <laughs> brought another topic and let's focus on Don't no worry, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> afternoon, how are you today? Hello. Good morning. Uh, in the PMMR, uh, you currently have no targets set for enrollment. Uh, is CUNY interested in seeing enrollment decline? Or would you like to see it increase as the population of our city increases? Or do you want it to stay flat? I think goals are helpful. What should the goal be? Yeah, I think overall we, want, we, we definitely want to see enrollment increase. But for each individual campus, that might be different. There might be some campuses that we feel are um, at their maximum that we want to hold so, flat. But I think overall, we do want to see an increase. OK, so will you change your targets in the MMR with an up arrow to indicate that Throughout the CUNY system, you're looking for the community co college enrollment and the senior colleges to go up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll work um, with the administration on um, the next iteration of the Okay, of so, the, and, and I guess of the management report to reflect that. Ne next question. Uh, as we talk about economic development, one of my colleagues brought up Amazon and $3 billion for 25 or 35 or whatever many billion dollars in incentive. Do CUNY graduates earn more income and therefore pay more taxes than folks who do not possess a community college or college degree? Absolutely. And not only that, but um, I think the data shows that about 80% of CUNY graduates actually remain in New York State, New York City after they graduate. So not only are they earning a higher salary because they have a CUNY degree, but they're staying here and, and are uh, contributing to the tax base. I, I, I thought that would be your answer. Now, I'm really pleased about the testimony about a $300 million, sorry, $295 million investment in LaGuardia Community College and Bronx Community College for infrastructure. Will that yield additional seats? Will that yield additional students and additional capacity? The, 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 I, Is your mic on? The LaGuardia? The, the roughly $300 million, will it yield new school seats? Will it yield more economic activity? It will, it will, the LaGuardia will, will basically yield more, more uh, seats, um, more space, because we, have, we had to take care of the interior before, the exterior before we touch the interior. So, but so this now, won't affect the interior. The interior is the next phase. Yes. How much is that phase going to cost? Well, we are, the, the size of that building is almost, this, it's 800,000 square feet, which is, almost the size of one or two of our colleges. So each floor of that building to renovate it costs somewhere about in, in the excess of $80 million. So in that building, five, four and a half, four and a half floors are occupied. Okay. We are working on so the infrastructure So you're going to do one more floor for $80 million. That will increase your capacity by at least 20%. I can't, I'll, I'll have to give you what the percentage is. It depends on what the program is that's in there. Okay. How many people can you educate in a hole in the ground? Um, not many. Does CUNY currently own a hole in the ground in my district? CUNY owns the site at 74th Street, yes. And um, how would you describe that site? Is it a site where it is ready to educate students? No, it's not. Okay. Do you currently have a plan in this whole document and all your testimony to do something with that hole in the well, ground. Well, actually, um, the request for the need for the building is in this in in our request. But we are now meeting with the state. We're meeting with um, the city, and we're meeting with um, MSK um, 
as we speak to talk about what we can do to basically take care of the issue that you're describing. What, what are the number of, uh, how much are you asking for in the, your document? The new document asks for 300 million for the corn shell. And for $300 million, how many square feet and how many students will we be able to educate? Um, the, that's only the corn shell, and that would be the entire population of the nursing school. So what is the population of the nursing school? Uh, I'll have to get back to you on the total population. And do nurses make a living wage? Do they earn somewhere around sixty to $80,000? Do they earn more than the area median income? And are those good jobs that we should be creating that have economic attacks? I think they're very good jobs, yes. $300 million, we've actually raised that for just a park in my district. We have invested $275 million in a park. Can, will, will CUNY commit $300 million to get this done and fill this hole in the ground and educate hundreds if not thousands of nurses and generate well, the economic the, activity that comes with it? The $300 million is for the corn shell. So how much to get it all done? Probably $800 million. It's $300 million to build an entire building, and then you're estimating a half a for billion dollars a to put inside. Building a science building where half of it is for the nursing school and the other half is for research. Why is your number $800 million when I believe Hunter's number is $360 million? Because if you look, it's the, the, I think the $360 million that you're talking about is the corn shell. I, I think that there's a problem when we're talking about 300 million and then you're throwing on another, it's 800 million additional on top of the 300 or oh, to total? The total. I, I, can we get the 300 million dollars to get the shell built? Well, we are really pushing very hard to basically ask for that. We Is it in your request, request to the council? Is it in your testimony today? It's in the request. Will you, will you ask us right now for the 300 million? Yes. Yes, I will ask. Can you ask? We need money to build the, the science building, the corn shell, 300 million. Okay, thank you. Next question. I see that uh, according to our numbers, you have 14,166 full-time instructional staff, 17,986 part-time instructional staff. Is that roughly accurate? I think full-time staff, we have about 7,600 full-time staff. And part-time staff, um, I'm sorry, Councilman Callis, can you repeat I, that number that you had? I'm talking about instructional staff. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I have 14,166 full-time instructional staff uh, from the fall of 2017 numbers, which we have access to, and uh, 17,986 part-time instructional staff. Yeah, the, the full-time staff is about 7,600 instructional staff, and the part-time staff, um, I will get you the actual number, but I believe it's probably about uh, 13,000, not 17,000. Okay, so our numbers were actually better for you than your numbers because you're saying that there are twice as many part-time staff than full-time staff, so could we perhaps go from, what, what if, so I guess first question, do you think that professors and instructional staff and educational staff can do a better job if they are full-time or part-time? Research shows that um, in terms of uh, progress to degree for students and outcomes for students that it's better to have a full-time instructor. Thank you, I really appreciate that level of honesty. Uh, will CUNY, in the interest of the information you just shared, thank you because otherwise we would have gone back and forth a lot, uh, <laughs> commit to doubling the instructional staff so that, the full-time instructional staff, so you're not relying on part-time instructional staff. By the way, this is personal to me because my mother t was an adjunct at John Jay and LaGuardia and that mm -hmm. was not a living. I yeah. was on free and reduced school lunch while she was teaching at, at CUNY. No, I hear you, and, and um, in our budget request, we are seeking funding for, to hire 800 additional full-time faculty over the next four years. We very much value our, our part-time faculty. We have wonderful adjunct faculty, um, but as I said earlier, the studies do show it's better outcomes for students with full-time faculty, so we do have a commitment to grow our full-time faculty, but again, we, we're seeking funding in, in order for us to do so. Uh, would you be willing to be a little bit more aggressive and just say let's double the full-time faculty and double the number of students we can, so, sorry, so we can increase and do better by our students? Um, well, if we, can, if we can get funding for 800 over four years, we'll start there. Um, 
and, and you know, make sure that we can continue to uh, hire more full-time faculty. Doubling is a, is a very aggressive, uh, you know, number, so I, I don't want to commit to that right now, but um, our request is seeking funding for 800 over four years. Uh, my final question is, relates to this Excelsior Scholarship. I, yeah. When I was running in 2012, I wanted to make uh, CUNY available through a very similar model. Governor Cuomo proposed a model. It's something that I support, but I'm disappointed. According to our numbers, there's only 475 uh, out of 23,000 Excelsior recipients uh, in the CUNY system. Is that correct, and how do we get Excelsior for more CUNY students? Yeah. I think that number probably refers to the um, number, that sounds close to the number of community college Excelsior recipients. The total number of Excelsior recipients in last year, in, in academic year 17, 18, which was the first year of the program, was a little over 3,300. So CUNY had about 3,300 Excelsior students in, in the first year. How do we increase that? Yeah, I'm, thank you, Mike. 3,264 3, in year one. So how do we, how do we increase that number? Well, we're, we are expecting an increase for this year, and again, you know, we're in the middle of, of the year, and so, um, thank you, Elaine. So, so numbers are, um, we do expect an increase in the numbers, and we, and we think that we'll have well over 4,000 for this year. Um, it's only year two of the program, so I think as the program, um, you know, continues that we will certainly see an expansion at CUNY. Thank you. I just need to get a little clarity. You say you have 7,627 full-time instructional Correct. personnel. Correct. As of uh, 2018, as of fall 2018. So That's with both the senior semester. and community colleges. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then in um, a document that, that you have submitted here on page 223, uh, it says that there are 11,600 part-time faculty. Is yeah, that? That it's, it's probably a little bit more now. Okay. Um, but yes, that sounds like it's in the, in the ballpark of where we are in part-time faculty. And then for adjunct full-time employee count, according to the City Human Resources Management System, it indicates that there are 1,841 adjuncts on payroll. Um, I'll have to check that number. Um, we consider the adjuncts part-time employees, so, um, so I have to go back and check that. Okay. Be yeah, sorry, yes, I don't and, have an And we'd like to get that by yeah, college we'll because go back and look at that. the entry uh, in my information says adjunct full-time employees, okay, we'll so go back it's somewhat confusing. Okay. So if you could clarify that, that would be great. We will. Now, um, <clears throat> Council Member Holden talked about new employees. Did you tell us how many of those were adjuncts who moved up? Because I know that's an issue that he has raised before. And in addition to that question, what would be the cost for the 200 employees that you want to target right. over the next four years? What would be the cost if we looked internally to the adjuncts who are already yeah. Yeah. familiar with the university, who have demonstrated a level of uh, uh, com competency, what would be the cost for us to move adjuncts already within the system to those other lines? Right. I, I, I'm going to give you a, uh, an answer that um, doesn't directly answer your question, but because it, it, the answer really is it depends, and it depends on how many courses that adjunct is teaching. So the average um, the average amount an adjunct earns per course currently is about $3,600 per course. Um, so if they're teaching, let's say, uh, two courses a semester and they're teaching four courses a year, they'd probably be earning about $14,000 as an adjunct. Um, so if we were con to convert that person to a full-time lecturer, let's say, that would probably cost us fifty dollars to $60,000 for that one person. If someone's, if, if there's an adjunct teaching a higher workload and is, and is earning in the $20,000 range, then the cost would be less of converting them. Um, so it, it really depends on the, the individual, individual adjunct that we're targeting to, to be converted into the lecture series. Uh, who decides on maintaining an adjunct roster rather than hiring a full-time instructor? 
It's at the local level, at the college level. College um, president. College president has the ultimate responsibility. And um, just to drill down a little bit more, at the department level, the department chair is working with the college provost and the college president. Is there a time limit on uh, how long a person can stay at a particular title before they either move up or or terminated or no longer? For an adjunct, no. Um, no. For are there other titles though that have that requirement? Yeah, for the for the full time faculty, um, there is, a, and and I, I don't have the uh, specifics, but we can get it for you. But I know that there is a a time for which they will either be granted tenure or not. Um, but we can get back to you with the specifics on that. But, but yes, there is, a, there is a time limit on that. Okay. Uh, going back to child care, what's the status of the, first, what's the status of the child care center at City, which was a target that we talked about four, at least four years ago? Thanks, Chair. So we were, I, I, we were in the process of renovating that house. That was the, I think that was the old president's house. Um, and that building will be completed for the next term and it looks pretty terrific. Why did it take so long? You could have demolished it and put up another building for the time that it's taken and to be so far behind schedule for opening. The, the reason we're so far behind schedule is because we had issues with the uh, contractor. That's, that's what the delay was. Couldn't just terminate you know, the contract another one? You know, I have to tell you, we had numerous discussions about whether we should do that or whether we should, we should not. And we're, we're, we had it two or three months ago. We made a decision and we're going forward. And in construction projects, that, that's what comes up if you have a problem with a contract. Do you like cut the contractor off um, or do you let the contractor stay? And I have to say that there are people in this room, I sometimes want to cut it off, they come back and tell me. So that's kind of the, the give and take. But this one has been a real problem. Is there a this way then for um, you to be able to make some note of that in your evaluation of the process so that the city has on record what your concerns were uh, regarding the delay in this project? Well, this, this, um, this project was built by our partner, DASNY, um, and they absolutely know about that, and there is a record of performance for every contractor, so we don't land up in the same position, but this, this building should have been finished six months ago. You're absolutely right. Um, how does CUNY or the college determine the age groups that will be served? And that's a follow up also to the question. Someone who has a child who's uh, under a year, but they want to come back, it's only six months old or whatever the age is, and they want to come back. How does CUNY determine the ages that they will serve this at a particular child care center? Chair Barron, if it's okay with you, I'd like to make another call to the bullpen and ask Keisha Fuentes to Thank come you. join us to, to address that. Thank you. It's actually based on their license capacity. Um, if they have a, a license for infant, toddler, toddler, um, preschool, they'll be able to serve um, that need. If they don't, then they'll have to refer them to another campus to serve them. So it's determined by the license that they hold? Yes. Okay. And also, I think, following up on the question, I think that it needs to be consideration that as we uh, go into construction, that we build in a component that talks about incorporating, as a matter of fact, a child care center so that person's coming into the, to the program, into the college. So you can add that into your plans for the $300 million that you're asking for the construction of the nurses' uh, quarters on 72nd Street. I think we can be forward thinking with that, and it, I think it'll help it'll increase the parity in terms of women being able to get back into the workforce. Just a few more questions, and I do thank you for uh, your patience. The state budget talks about um, uh, $250, well, it talks about the FTEs 
and the university has requested a $250 increase. Mm -hmm. Correct. How are we going to try to, what's the total that we need to actually be able to make sure that the funding that we get for FTEs is adequate? Because it hasn't matched inflation over the years. Yeah, no, that's a great point, Chair Barron. We, um, we've been fortunate in that the last um, five years, the legislature and the governor have increased the state base aid, but you're absolutely right in that if you go back to 2008, right before the recession, um, and you add inflation to what the base aid number was, we are behind. Um, it should be, uh, currently the base aid per FTE is $2,847 per student FTE. But if you, if you, again, if you take that 2008 number and add inflation on it, it should be well over 3,000. So we are short um, and we are seeking $250 to, to get us back to, to that level. Um, and we're hopeful that um, our folks and our, our funding partners in the Assembly and the Senate will be able to, to help us um, reach that level. And regarding the TAP gap, um, it's the difference between what the student's TAP grant is and the tuition charges. If the state does not come in and fill the gap, which is estimated at $72 million uh, and growing to $85 million in the out years, what's CUNY's plan to fill the gap? Well, the, the TAP gap is, is revenue foregone. So it's, it's revenue that we would have earned um, that we're not earning. So. Um, that is a really important and, and uh, primary component of our budget request. We are seeking um, to, uh, $20 million a year for over the next four years to help us close that tap gap. Um, so that would provide $80 million. And then additionally, we're seeking about $5 million, $4.9 million for what we're calling tap gap parity. Um, because the way the tap gap works, as you described, Chair Barron, is it looks at what CUNY's tuition rate is versus the maximum tap award. Mm -hmm. the, the colleges that have a greater proportion of students that receive tap are the ones who are foregoing more revenue proportionally. So we're looking for $4.9 million in order to give to those campuses to provide more parity when it comes to the tap gap. So it's a really important um, component of our budget request, and we are. Um, we are talking to the folks um, in both the Assembly and Senate to try to get some help there in, in the state enacted budget. And when was the last time that the tap ceiling was raised? Do you know? Oh, the last time the tap ceiling was raised was probably sometime in 2012 or 13. I can get you the exact number, but um, right now it's, it's 5,165, and it's been, it's been several years since it was raised. Right. I think it was around so, 2013. And in terms of that parity, you mentioned uh, schools that have greater numbers of students and also the senior colleges, yes. which has a higher tuition, has that. Uh, yeah, and the tap gap, I should point out, is only an issue at the senior colleges. Our community college tuition is $4,800, so we're below the tap, maximum tap award. So we don't have a tap gap at the community colleges. So the tap gap that we're referring to, the $72 million, is all at the senior colleges. Okay. Okay. Council Member Holden, do you have any further questions? Okay, great. Okay. So before we let you go, Sure. We just, uh, we have a list of things that we would like you to follow up with. Sure. One is the dollar amount that's devoted to improving diversity mm -hmm. hiring. Two, a census plan for CUNY, the mm -hmm. details and the costs, et cetera. Right. Three, a portion of CUNY's community colleges uh, of property that is city owned versus leased. And the number four, the adjunct professor breakout by community college. And we have some conflicting data between right. what we have, so we would ask for right. resolution. We'll, yep, we'll with work those with council issues. finance staff to, to clarify that. Thank you, that's very helpful. We'll get back to you on, on all of those points. Okay, just before you go, let me look at my notes. It seems like there's something I'm forgetting. Um, just the other portion of making sure that we use 
the pool of talent that we have, not just for bringing adjuncts to lecturers' positions, but moving uh, people past the assistant and associate professor ceiling that seems to be there at CUNY. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we, we remove those barriers and that we give support to the people that are there. And in terms of new hires, that's great, but we've got to keep the percentages growing, and the only way we're going to do that is by retaining the faculty that we do have. Excellent point. Thank you. Okay, I think that it, if it's not, we'll have further questions. We'll send them to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time. Thank you for your Thank support. You. We'll call our next panel. If there's anyone else who's here uh, and you haven't filled out an appearance card, you can see a clerk at the desk and get a card and fill it out. This time, we're going to hear from Barbara Bowen, who is president of the Professional Staff Congress. No, you can talk to the sergeant at arms. He'll help you. Thank you. It's still morning, so good morning. Good morning. And we're so pleased to have Barbara Bowen here from uh, Professional Staff Congress, and we extend this opportunity for you now to give us your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Barron, and I also thank the other members. I know Council Member Holden is here, and others have been here. Um, we thank you all for holding the hearing and also the Finance Committee. Um, very important for us to have the opportunity. We'll be submitting written testimony, so I'll just um, I'll go uh, over our main, I'd like to raise our main points, and I have a couple of comments on the questions that were asked of the uh, CUNY administration. Um, first, I, I want to say that we are very grateful of the 30,000 members of the PSC, who include part-time and full-time faculty and staff, uh, very grateful for the City Council's advocacy, continued advocacy for CUNY students and for our faculty and staff. It makes a huge difference to us. Um, we also, in this budget, in the Mayor's uh, preliminary budget for 2020, we're grateful uh, to see that he continues his commitment that he's had throughout his term of office to increase funding for STEM programs and ASAP in the community colleges and to fund the city workers' contracts. That may seem like a no-brainer to fund the contracts, but it is not everywhere, and that's an important commitment, and we are grateful to, uh, to the mayor for that. We're also pleased to see a modest increase in the preliminary budget of $8.3 million for the community colleges, but we're concerned that the $6.8 million peg, the cost savings target, will eat up most of this gain. Um, we do have uh, concerns that the mayor has again zeroed out uh, almost 12 million in critical programs such as child care services. They should really be included in the base budget and not uh, be an item for discussion every year. And I, I noted that you did have questions about that. Um, I want to applaud 
the city's commitment to keeping the community college tuition affordable. Uh, the uh, tuition for the four-year colleges has gone up every year by $200. It's very important that the city has enabled that uh, tuition to remain affordable um, and that the CUNY has not had to raise the community college tuition for four years. But the resources on campus are stretched to the limit and there really needs to be an increase in funding. I mean, the, the main message that we have to deliver is that yes, uh, we, we note that the mayor has added funding for specific programs. Um, we also note that some uh, line items are zeroed out, but above all, we need to see an increased investment in CUNY. Um, and this is a point that we've raised with the mayor. He, uh, there's an education um, press conference going on downstairs in City Hall as I came in. Uh, the mayor has made real strides at the beginning end of school, pre-K and pre-pre-K, and those are absolutely important. But we feel that CUNY is such an important part of the city, such an engine of development and advancement, um, that, it's, uh, that a progressive agenda for the city should highlight CUNY in a way it has yet to be highlighted. Um, so uh, there are a few things that we want to uh, focus on, and I'll just give you some of the numbers. Um, we are requesting an additional investment of $112.8 million in next year's budget to be able to provide continuing quality education. And this breaks down as $70 million in mandatory cost increases. And I'll be submitting this so um, you'll have all the details. Um, that's $35 million in building rentals and fringe benefits, et cetera. Um, and then um, $35 million for to fulfill the negotiated agreement that I remember Chairperson Barron spoke so powerfully about when we testified right in this room about having full-time faculty be able to have more time with students and having a more reasonable teaching load. That agreement was reached and that day of testimony I think was pivotal and I thank the council for that, but it has not been funded. It has to be funded. Otherwise, it's just going to be an occasion for bringing in more underpaid adjuncts and defeating the entire purpose. The purpose was to give more of the faculty more time to invest in individual students because that is the key factor in student progress and student completion. When that agreement has not been funded, it just means that the courses that a full-time faculty member might have taught are now being filled in by part-time faculty who have zero paid time in many cases to spend with students. So that flips the entire purpose and we're calling on you to fund that in the amount that <coughs> CUNY requested in the past, 35 million. Um, we're also requesting 32.8 million to uh, cover two decades worth of inflation in the amount that the city um, contributes to the senior colleges at CUNY. Historically, the city has contributed to the colleges for the um, number of students who are in associate's degree programs in four-year colleges because the city um, historically and in an analog to all of other cities is responsible for the two-year degrees, the state for the four-year and higher degrees. There are uh, many, many students in associate's programs in the four-year colleges. The city has contributed for that purpose for that education, but the number has not gone up in more than two decades. And we support and ask you to support CUNY administration's request that that go up um, just by the amount of inflation. Um, and finally, we ask you, I think you asked about the tap gap. Um, it's largely a problem in the four-year colleges because that's where the tuition uh, gap occurs. Um, but there are, again, associate's degree students who are paying four-year college tuition because they are in a four-year college. And the tap gap for them is about $10 million. So we're asking you for two things there. One is to call on the city to fill that tap gap of 10 million and to urge your colleagues in the state legislature who've been very good on this, very strong. We had a big rally yesterday. You would have loved seeing all those beautiful students there. We were in the Capitol yesterday. But to urge your state colleagues and the governor to put in the money to cover the uh, more like $74 million gap that now exists in the, uh, in the four-year colleges funded by the state. And it's, a, it's just not a logical structure to build in a deficit for every student who comes in with TAP. I mean, it's a, a deficit creator with every student. It's great that the students don't have to pay the difference between the full TAP amount and the um, full tuition, but to create 
a structural deficit for every student who comes in with TAP doesn't make fiscal sense. It's just not good policy, and uh, we ask the city to lead the way, as you have many times, and fill that TAP gap for the um, associate's degree students and call on the state to do the same. Um, I want to speak a little bit about um, the chronic underfunding at CUNY and also about adjunct faculty. So let me start with the adjunct faculty. You asked some very um, probing questions and Councilmember Kalos also asked, asked some questions. I think part of the confusion in numbers is that the, um, the IPEDS data, the uh, national data, uses the phrase instructional staff to cover more than faculty in the classroom. That it covers people who are working in instructional, could be working in um, counseling and other areas. So I, I think the confusion in the numbers could be, can be clarified. Um, but let me talk about the adjuncts. Uh, we are currently uh, working, let me just take this off. We're currently working with the city, with the Office of Labor Relations and with the mayor's office to resolve our contract. And as the union that represents both the part-time and the full-time faculty and this professional staff, uh, we have made this the contract in which we must solve the scandal of adjunct pay. And as you pointed out, there are two problems. One is the low pay, and the other is the overuse of adjuncts. I mean, there was a time when an adjunct might be somebody like one of you on the council, uh, or your staff who might come in from a full-time job, a decently paid full-time job, and teach one course as an enhancement. There's always a place for that in colleges. That's an addition for students. But what's happened now is that with the budget being so hollowed out by both the city and state um, that the basic, the most central operation of the university, teaching, is where the university has been forced to cut costs. And they've cut costs on labor. Of course, in a university, the biggest cost is labor, and that is primarily teaching. So how has CUNY survived years and years of chronic underfunding by both the state and the city, even more acutely by the state? They've done two things. One, raise tuition, so students are paying more. And two, cut their biggest cost, which is teaching. So instead of a full-time faculty member paid $80,000 a year. I mean, our pay is not high, $80,000, $90,000 a year. You have four or three part-time faculty members paying three, paid $3,200 a course or $3,500 a course. And so it's about a quarter of the per course rate, a third or a quarter. So that's how they've cut their, their labor costs in order to survive a budget that has been decimated. So we are calling on the state and city to rebuild that budget. And in the meantime, as the labor union, uh, especially at a moment where both the city and state have taken leadership roles in raising the minimum wage, we have said that this is the contract in which the adjuncts also must make a decent wage, a living wage. Because if you take the 3,200 minimum pay per course and divide that by the number of hours it takes to actually teach a course, grading, preparing, meeting with students, responding to their emails, counseling, uh, the actual pay works out to be just about minimum wage or lower. So for people with PhDs, master's degrees, teaching the next generation of college students, responsible for conveying to them the message that if you finish your college degree, a good future awaits you, that very person who has a college degree and a couple of advanced degrees is making less than minimum wage. There is something very wrong about that. Um, so we have been working with the city and the um, Office of Labor Relations to try to come to a resolution of our contract, and we call on the city council, let's say not if, but when we reach that resolution, and I think we have some good ideas, um, for you to support the funding necessary to solve our contract. Because just being honest, there is no way to resolve the adjunct pay issue within the framework of the um, existing fairly modest raises that are uh, across the board in all the city contracts, which are around 2%. Raising a $3,200 wage by 2% does not get you anywhere. And we're calling for 7,000 per course for adjuncts, um, which is in line with other, it's fairly modest actually, Fordham pays 8,000, Barnard pays 10,000, Rutgers, uh, well, Penn State pays 6,000, Rutgers is currently organizing for 7,000. So it's, 
it's in the realm, and that's what we're calling for, and we are calling on the uh, city council to support us as we um, hope that we come to a conclusion and are able to reach a contract uh, agreement. And finally, there are other supports that the city council has been very strongly um, uh, very strongly advocating for. We are thrilled that the DREAM Act has finally passed. I mean, that is, and been enacted, that is fantastic news. Um, that uh, may increase the TAP gap because those students are now eligible for TAP, so we're asking you to, to um, make sure that that does not occur. And we call on you, as always, to do, and I know you've done this under um, Council Member Inez Barron's leadership, to um, make the case that there should be overall increase in CUNY investment. So we call on the council this year to support us in our um, advocacy for 112.8 million, which would cover mandatory costs, to cover the TAP gap, um, address the teaching load agreement that we came to, and also to ask you for your support when we reach that beautiful day when adjunct faculty at CUNY will be paid a living wage and we will not be sweatshop you uh, and really a disgrace. Uh, and above all, we ask for all these things because every single one of them has an impact on students' education. It's all about students' education. And that's, that's why we're here, why we do what we do, and we call on you to support that. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Ms. Bowen, for coming and offering your testimony. In terms of adjuncts, do we have any idea of the percentage of those who are adjuncts who don't want to move to full-time? They're satisfied and happy with just one or two courses that they're teaching? Uh, we've done surveys of adjuncts, because I would like to know that number more precisely, too. Uh, we say there are about 12,000 adjuncts. I think that the number Matt Sapienza gave you was 11,600, something about 12,000 adjuncts. Um, taking it the other way, taking your question the other way, I would say there are at least 3,000, maybe 4,000, maybe slightly more, who would want to be in a full-time position. Um, those are largely people who went through graduate school as I did. They got their advanced degrees. They came uh, to look for a job with their PhD, maybe a master, maybe two masters. And then they found that nationwide, and especially in CUNY, because the, the budget had been hollowed out, the full-time jobs had dried up. Um, the others might be somebody who is a professional in maybe a creative field or government, somebody like you. Um, there are some people who are um, teachers in the K through 12 system who teach in our education departments. Then there's some people who are nurses, for instance, um, who teach in the nursing departments. But I would say there are you know, several thousand, maybe 4,000, who would make the move if they could from part-time, you know, a, a patchwork of part-time jobs to a full-time job. And of those 4,000, uh, that's your estimate. Of those 4,000, do we know if they have credentials that would, in fact, allow them to become full, full professors or associate professors? In other words, do they have PhDs? Right. Uh, some have PhDs. And again, we've, uh, we did a survey of adjunct. I'll get you the results. I mean, for one thing, it's, it's um, difficult to reach every adjunct because some are just there for a semester. So uh, I don't feel that the results were scientifically verifiable, but we did do a survey of what your highest degree was. There's quite a high percentage who have a PhD. So they could be, there are some with published books. They could be a candidate for a uh, research job. There are many, many others. Of course, they all have to have an advanced degree. So the others would have a master's degree or an MFA, and they could be, uh, a very strong candidate for a lecturer's job. What's the average length of service? How long does the average adjunct stay as an adjunct before they move on or leave yeah. the system? I just looked How at those. Adjuncts? I just looked at those statistics, and I can get them to you. Um, the uh, of the current. I'm thinking back. Uh, the 2018 adjuncts. There were well over. Um, there were well over 2,000 who had been here, maybe it was uh, five years. I'll have to get you that to be precise about it, because we did do a regression of how long everybody had been here. Um, I would say the average adjunct, just guessing, 
uh, might be at CUNY four years. Uh, but there are people in my own department at Queens College who are adjuncts who've been there 30 years. 30 years. There are many adjuncts who've been there 15, 20 years. Um, so there are, you know, there are adjuncts who are 75 years old and still teaching, and they've been adjuncts for their whole career. Do you see an opportunity to um, work with CUNY in terms of using this adjunct pool to fill this hopeful 200 new hires that they want to get? Yes. Do you see an opportunity to actually have a structured program to be able to benefit from the yes. persons that are adjuncts now? Yes, and I would say that great as it would be to have another 200 full-time faculty, the point you raised or uh, Councilmember Kalos earlier, um, that's, that does not address the need. I mean, we're 5,000 full-time faculty short. To, so to say 800 in whatever it was, four years or something. Four years. Yeah, that does not get us anywhere near the need. This is a structural short changing of our students. So, so yes, on the, so on the other point you raised, the um, union has, um, I won't say negotiated because hiring management maintains that as their prerogative, but we have come to agreements in the past on several programs to um, hire, to create new full-time lines reserved for adjuncts who have taught for a certain number of semesters consistently. And we've done several of those agreements, and in each one there have been 100, 200, or more hires of, out of the existing CUNY adjunct pool. It's still a um, competitive hire, but in order to be considered, you have to be a current CUNY adjunct, and you have to have taught for five years or, or whatever. That, and so we have successfully done that several times. I'd love to do it again. It has been fantastic as a program. I've seen it in my own department, completely transformational. And um, we are very eager to do it with CUNY again. Uh, CUNY said that uh, the ratio is about 29 to 1. And that's the ratio of all the instructional staff. And we know that not all of them are actually Right. doing instruction. So right. that was, I think, the ratio for full-time uh, employees. If you had 5,000 more, what ratio would that generate? Um, I, I might have missed the, when they said that. They said that was the ratio of faculty to students? Student-faculty yes. ratio? Was, yes, because I think we've... Holden asked that. Uh, okay. Full-time faculty to student, you know, students. Students. Full-time faculty to students. Students, I actually, to students ratio. Yeah. Okay, last time we looked, it was more like 33. Um, and we did a table, which I can send you, of other places, um, uh, you know, where uh, it's, you know, in, in the University of Maryland, it's maybe 18 to 1, um, 20 to 1 other places. I can't do the computation without really looking at the numbers more carefully, but um, it, would, it would be completely revolutionizing our faculty. I mean, we have 7,600 or so full-time faculty now. If you added 5,000, you're up to 12,000 full-time faculty or more, almost 13,000, for the same number of students. I mean, the, the ratio would go down by like three quarters because that represents about a 70% increase, uh, 5,000 over 7,600. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the ratio would go down by about three quarters. And you know, you're, I know you're an educator and uh, I know you understand that really nothing makes a bigger difference than how, how big the classes are and how much time your faculty have with you. So yes, if there were one thing I could change at CUNY, it would be um, restore the budget so they could pay the part-timers that we have fairly and transform the faculty to uh, full-time faculty. Professor Hall, I'm Professor I'm going back to your CUNY days. Yes. Councilmember Holden, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, Barbara, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your leadership. Talking about adjuncts, uh, for decades, adjuncts got no health care, right. um, low pay, and, and in my um, college, City Tech, we had adjuncts for decades who had to run around to different institutions to teach another class, run or go out to, um, up to the Bronx, teach a, a course there, go down to the Manhattan, teach a course there, and run over to City Tech. That's right. And, but what you did in, in the union, you just just to get health care for if you taught over six hours, two classes, um, and an office hour, yes. which was an amazing accomplishment. I never thought I'd see that. Right. Um, but the, what, what continuing hap what's happening is 
that these adjuncts, you're right, they're almost te teaching for minimum wage. It's, right. it's, a, it's amazing. Right. Um, I don't know how they do it, many of them for decades, but we need, and, but it's bec the only reason that it's not moving is because that's what, what CUNY can, has to do because we don't get funded. That's right. Um, we don't get the funding, so and they're not hiring full time uh, as much as they should. Obviously, we were always behind. And they have to function with an adjunct faculty on low pay, and, and we, we allow that, and the state is allowing that. So what we need to do is, again, you're fighting the great fight, 7,000 is not a lot right. for one course, uh, and, but we need to actually implement that. And I hope that, that works, and, and I thank you for your leadership. Thank um, you. The adjuncts are the abused class in CUNY, definitely. Yes. Well, thank you, Council Member Holden. And I know that of all the people here, you know that better than anyone else, uh, and I appreciate that. Um, and I think having the council support as we try to come to an agreement with CUNY, uh, with CUNY management, and uh, try to have the support of the mayor and the governor to reach that is really important. And for you to be able to say, you know, it, it is not right for people to be teaching for minimum wage. Um, so yes, we were able to get a uh, paid office hour for every two courses, for people teaching a certain number of courses. There should be a paid office hour for every course. I mean, why is it that, I mean, we now have 60% of the courses in the four-year schools taught by adjuncts. So that means that 60% of the time a student is going to be in a class where she or he has a chance of not having any regulated time outside of class to meet with the, the professor. And as you say, that person is then dashing off to City College or, or someplace else to teach, or to dog walking job or janitorial job. One of the adjuncts spoke to me about uh, bumping into a student when uh, he was working as a janitor, and the student looked at him and said, professor? Uh, and he was the first to say there is dignity in the janitorial work, but it was a hard moment when a student said to me, you're my professor and you're the janitor in this building? I mean, there is something very wrong with the, the message that sends to the students um, and the, the message it sends about how much New York City values their education. Uh, I think it's a, a terrible message. We, we had such a uh, dedicated adjunct staff that many of them would volunteer time. They do, stay after, yes. become before class. You, you just can't show up right. and teach a class and then run. So many of them would stay, ask, answer questions for the students, stay, they had a, one paid office hours, some of them. Some of them. Some of them. Right. And would stay two or three, four hours. Right. So it, it's not fair. It's and, not and fair. It's, and it's really not fair. And, um, you know, the, the fight you, you're, you're fighting is, is definitely worthwhile. Um, the adjunct faculty, we need to get more of them into full time. I, I, w I would think like 80% of my, uh, the adjuncts at my, um, my de in my department would want a full time yeah. position rather than yeah. running around um, to every, uh, you know, every part of the uh, CUNY to try to just make ends meet. And it's, and it's really not fair. So I, again, I thank, thank you very you. much. I have to run to another okay. meeting. Thank, thank you very right. much. Thank you. Uh, it's great to have your, your questions. Um, thank you so much for your testimony, and we look forward to getting it in written form. Great. Right. Thank so you so much. It. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And thank you for I, your leadership. Thank you. I did want, I knew there was another question I wanted to ask CUNY before they left. Just wanted to make a comment that we're so pleased that we now have a chancellor at the helm who's steering CUNY as it's moving forward, and look forward to having a chance to dialogue with him and to get him to tell us how he's going to help CUNY to continue to grow. Yes. And in my opinion, uh, I'm opposed to annual tuition increases. We're glad that community college has not, been able, has not had to bear that brunt. And my objective is to make CUNY tuition free. That's my objective. And with that, seeing no others wishing to give testimony, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.